it was very interesting to observe today that we were told to observe two minutes silence. You know the importance of it. If you go to high courts, you cannot talk. You have to observe silence by the force of law. There is a meaning to it. You go to International Court of Justice at The Hague. Nobody can even whisper. It's not allowed. It's not permitted. You go to United Nations General Assembly or Security Council discussions. It's not that you cannot talk to a person who is sitting next to you because you may not know what language he is speaking. So each and everyone is provided with a automatic instant translator that what I speak, it is converted to your language, you have to listen. And the purpose of it is to show the significance of silence <coughs> because only in silence knowledge comes. It has been explained and illustrated very powerfully by many people. That apart, and today's topic of the discussion is integral knowledge in education. We often hear this word integral knowledge and we often feel that this part of knowledge should be imbibed to be included in education. But how are we going to do that? And who will do that? If I do it for myself, it is for me. But if you have to do it, it's going to reach to different status of the society. Because I can communicate only here. Whereas what you get from me, or what you get from the discussion that we are going to have it here, only you will be able to communicate outside. That's the importance of it. So with that understanding, we will discuss, I would like to have it as an interactive session. You can interrupt me at any time. If you have a question, just kindly raise your hand. We can discuss immediately. And we will discuss the importance of integral knowledge in education. I will begin with an example. Each one of you here is not just a student for me. You may be a psychologist, you may be a medical practitioner, you may be a manager, you may be a scientist, she may be a sociologist, so on. There are many fields. If I finish my talk within half an hour, each and every one present here who are representing a particular discipline of thought will explain what this was all about, the speech was all about, the person was all about. A psychologist may say, yeah, he, able, he is able to speak in a different tempo, he is able to speak in a different pace, calm, quiet, same tempo, same modulation. He may assess my personality. If you are a manager, you will be able to assess me with the priority that I give for the flow of my ideas and the timing of a particular word and the entire organization of my speech. If you are a scientist, you will look at me at a different way. If you are a sociologist, you may assess me by looking at me. I may represent some kind of a philosophy or I may represent some kind of a discipline of thought and so on. What we are doing here in this, there is only one dimension here, but it is being perceived by many people outside. A psychologist or a sociologist, not necessarily you be a psychologist, you can analyze me psychologically, you can analyze me sociologically, you can analyze me from the point of view of administration, you can analyze me from the point of view of various disciplines of thought. Clear? But if I am able to understand what you, each and every stream of thought is going to explain about me, so that is integral knowledge. What you all could gather from different disciplines of thought, 
if I do it here, I can con convince a psychologist, I can convince a sociologist, I can convince a scientist, I can convince a person who is from the background of management. If I am able to convince, if I am able to connect, if I am able to make sense to each and every one, then the knowledge that I give, that which makes you convinced, that which makes you connected to what I am going to say, that knowledge is integral. Is it clear? Am I clear? That's how it starts. I will give you an example. I think the students here who are sitting here, they come from two streams. One is law and management. I will give you examples in law as well as in management to show that law and management has integral knowledge which you need to imbibe in order to develop it. I'm going to give you examples. I think law and management, right? We will go one by one. Pardon? Yes, fine. It's all part of management. I will give you examples to prove that. So the first definition of integral knowledge is a knowledge that which is full, is a knowledge that which is complete, is a knowledge that which is comprehensive, is a knowledge that which is inclusive. And education, you all know what it means. Education is to make you develop certain capacities is to make you develop certain abilities. So, integral knowledge is one that which has a comprehensive knowledge with certain set of abilities which if you have, you will be able to be a different person. In the end, in life, we all want to be a different person. We don't want to do the same thing. Right? We don't like monotony. We don't like to be unidimensional. Because our energy levels are different, our ideas are different, our life is different. So we want to do different things. So a knowledge that which is integral means that which is capable of something that is comprehensive, something that which is inclusive, something that which is full. And an education that are, are attempts to give that particular kind of knowledge is to develop that ability which is complete and full. I have seen many times, this is the 13th year of my teaching in different law schools. Certain times I ask a question to a certain student in a moot court competition. If I repeat the question second time, he loses his temper. He has knowledge but he has lost his temper. He has no peace of mind, there is no calm, there is no strength to hold himself. He immediately takes it personally and when he answers me back, the voice is, the pitch is little bit raised. You can do it to me, I will be able to correct you, but you can't do it in a court of law. You can't do that to a client. If you have to take a tough decision in the management, you need to be tough. It's not that you are tough, the decision is tough. Because you are taking a tough decision, not for yourself, not for the client, not for anyone else, but for the organization. <coughs> you have to be impersonal. You cannot be personal. So what I am trying to explain here is, an integral knowledge means it's just not just a mental data, just not mental content, but also your capability and your ability and your skills. Even among your Colleagues, you might have seen some students are capable of doing many things. You see, they are different. They have different capacity, they have different energy levels, different skills. So how to arrive at this kind of complete knowledge which can be taught in education? Take the case of Varo University, you are studying law as well as management. How are we going to do that? You may wonder why should we do that, what is the purpose in doing integral knowledge sir? Whatever that is there in the book, we will study, we will get a job. It's not the case. Precisely because of globalization, precisely because of liberalization and privatization, <coughs> things have expanded. You need to be the master of not just one, but many. A lawyer is no more just a lawyer, he is a good secretary. A lawyer is just no more a lawyer, he is a good manager. 
he knows how much to take from a client. He has to see each and every case. He, he is a psychologist. A manager is just not a manager. He knows. That's why in management you study different disciplines. HR, personal, labor, finance, and it keeps on expanding, it keeps on increasing. So, the very fact that the dimension keeps expanding, dimensions keep growing, we need to arrive at a particular knowledge which is comprehensive and which is full. How do we do that? It's better we do it now, otherwise it is very late. You know why? Almost many of the European countries, they started this. For example, Indian Penal Code, you all must be studying, those who are in law, they must be studying Indian Penal Code, and those who are doing MBA also, they must be reading Indian Penal Code after a point of time. We have Indian Penal Code, but Indian Penal Code, which prescribes punishments for all the crimes, they are not able to prevent the crime. They are only punishing the crime, they are not able to eliminate the criminals, they are not able to eliminate the crime as such. Why? Because it's not the problem of law, it's a problem belonging to sociology. It's a problem belonging to society. These are different problems. Isn't it? So, when one stream takes a particular role to do a particular thing, they find that particular stream is not able to solve that particular problem. What is this? It's precisely because they don't integrate. That's why interdisciplinary field came into existence. That's why multidisciplinary field came into existence. But even then there are limitations to it. People combine psychology and law, people combine sociology and law, politics and law, management and law. They are just trying to just keep those two things at an external level and try to see whether it can be worked out. It can't be. Because the human nature is different. The society functions on a different level. How do we do that? And that can come only through a knowledge which is comprehensive. That is the integral knowledge. Now you must be wondering, who gave this idea of integral knowledge, integral theory? Who, who propounded it? Who discovered it? How come, sir, you have all of a sudden talking about integral theory, it is the only solution for us. If you see, there were few people who brought this idea. One was Rudolf Steiner. He brought this idea of integral theory in which he felt all the social problems are not social. They are psychological. Again, all the psychological problems are not psychological. It is a bit social. All the management problems are not just problems of management. They are somewhat into a different disciplines. So they keep referring to each and every discipline. They take inputs from there. But you can only take inputs from there. But you cannot rectify it. You cannot eliminate it. That's why he brought the idea of integral theory or integral knowledge initially. Then came Ken Wilber and Jean Gibser. All these people brought this idea. And if I tell you this fact, you will be surprised. If you go and read Rudolf Steiner, the integral knowledge which you are all going to study, Ken Wilber or Jean Gibser, these are the three great proponents of integral theory. They have taken idea from Sri Aurobindo. They themselves have agreed. See the irony. An Indian scholar, an Indian sage who brought this idea of integral theory, there are no takers for that, but Westerners have taken some inputs from that and they developed a theory based on which in the year 1970, Jean Pichet brought the idea of transdisciplinary research. UNESCO brought the idea of transdisciplinary research. Now there are integral knowledge, integral theory institutes throughout the world. So this is where Students of Aro University and faculty of Aro University have a role to play. Before Westerners they catch that integral theory is their own theory, we need to work it out. And they themselves have very clearly said that these are all the theories which they have taken from an Indian master who is Sri Bindu. You go and read Rudolf Steiner, Ken Wilber, Jean Gesper. These are the three modern proponents of 
integral theory and they themselves have agreed very clearly and enunciated that these are the ideas that they have taken from Sri Aurobindo. It's very clear. So what does it mean according to Sri Aurobindo that integral knowledge is referred as what? An integral theory is referred as what? It has different components. One is it is individual to the collective, from micro to the macro. At a spiritual or at a religious level, it is individual to the cosmic and transcendental. Right? Point two, it is external as well as internal. The integral knowledge is something external as well as internal. Point one, the in integral knowledge is something from individual to the collective, from the external to the internal and the third important point is, it is that which is continuously multidimensional yet arriving at the singularity of <coughs> focus. Is it clear? I will explain to you how integral knowledge in management is applicable, it has been applied. How integral knowledge is been applied in law and it has been very successful. You all must be studying this particular book at one point of time, be it management or law. It's called the Constitution of India. Right? This is one very famous book, which contains a charter, which contains the mantra for each and every individuals who are living within the territory of India. You will never be able to forget this book. If I can show in this book by examples, Elements of integral knowledge, I can show. None would be able to believe. If I ask you to show, there is integral knowledge in this book. It requires some time, but it is there. Similarly, a book on management, take that this is a book on management. I will be able to show that there is integral theory in this book. There is integral knowledge in management. I am not bringing any theory which is a theory as if to be included in constitution or to be included in management. I can find in the pages, running pages, inside which there will be an understanding of integral knowledge. You can easily find out. Shall we do that exercise? Yes. Huh? yes. Very good. Now, now, have you understood what I am trying to explain as integral knowledge? Integral knowledge is that which is from the individual to the collective. Integral knowledge is that which is from the micro to the macro. Integral knowledge that which is multidimensional while retaining the same focus, main focus. And integral knowledge is that which is external as well as internal. Shall I show you? Go to Indian constitution, the first word, the first sentence. It says, preamble. In the preamble it says, if I read out, we the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice. And what is justice? They have given very clearly. Social, economic, political. Liberty of thought, expression, belief and faith and worship. Three, equality of status and opportunity and to promote them to all. And four, fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and the integrity of the nation. In our in constituent assembly, this 26th day of November 1949, do hereby adopt, enact, and to give ourselves this constitution. This was the first paragraph given in the Indian constitution. One of the greatest commentators of Indian constitution told, this entire Indian constitution is just a footnote to this preamble, Upendra Bhaksi. He said that, entire Indian constitution of 500 provisions, it is just only a footnote to this preamble. That much significance he gave. And the court, Indian courts have time and again told, if you want to interrupt, in, interrupt 
interpret any provisions of the Indian Constitution, preamble is the key to open the mind of the makers. Just see this, justice, liberty, <coughs> equality and fraternity. Is there any explanation for these four terms anywhere in the Indian Constitution? You need to only go to a dictionary. There is no explanation. But a judge has to take it and explain it and adopt it or implement it in such a way that he gives justice, equality, liberty and fraternity. And that approach is integral approach. He has to see. Otherwise it is very difficult for him. He cannot just like the two parties have come before him, he will decide according to the law. But he has to decide everything according to what is justice, what is equality, what is liberty and what is fraternity. There is no straight jacket formula to apply. He has to study each and every case. And he has to apply his mind. He has to apply his sense. And that sense is the inspiration of integral knowledge. How many times we have seen that the constitution being interpreted based on the preamble even to the extent of redefining our own provisions of the constitution? How many judgments are there? Such is the case. This is one example which I have given from the constitution. Now I, for those who are in management, I will explain one more thing. Business profits and corporate ethics, where does it stand? Business is being done for profits. You all are here to work only for profits. What the company says, what the company says, what the organization wants you to do. You have to do that. But at the same time they say ethics. Where does this moral come from? Corporate ethics. How does it come from? Where does it come from? Up to a particular point in a company, a company can set, make amount of profits, but beyond a point your profit profiteering motive is stopped. Beyond a point, your profiteering motivation is stopped. Because you need to think of the collective. Why? What is this principle called? After a point of time, you cannot take all the benefits, you cannot take all the profits. Why? Why? When you work hard and make a profit, you can encash all the profit. Why you are not able to take the profit completely? Why? Why you need to give some amount to the government by way of tax, why you need to give some amount to the government by way of corporate social responsibility and so on, why? That's where the integral knowledge comes. It is from the individual to the collective you have to share, you cannot just take it away. Why? You know why? The point is very simple. The resources that you are using is not your resources, it is national resources and it is natural resources. The resources that you are using, it's not yours. Have you created air? Have you created water? Have you created land? But when you are using these elements of nature, you cannot take away the profit completely. You have to give away some amount of profit to the society which is dependent on that. It's only an opportunity that which is given to you to take away some amount of profit, but after a point of time you have to give away. That's where the individual interests being expanded beyond a particular point to collective interests. You cannot take away. Take the case of corporate social responsibility. Why each and every company is now given a tag and a certificate of corporate social responsibility is precisely because a company is just not a company only for the sake of the company's profits and balance sheet. It has to go beyond that. When you take some profit, you have to give some amount to the society who are dependent on that because the interlink between the company and the profits and the material which you have used for profits, it's not yours. You are simply a trustee. Take the case of environment law. When you walk on the road, do you know that you cannot cut trees? If anyone cuts tree on the road, you can stop them and tell, don't cut trees. You are liable under law. Why? Because the court decided, 
plants, river, water, air, they belong to nature. You are just trustees. You have a trust over them, that's all. You cannot disturb them, it is not your property. A trustee is one who holds the property for the sake of beneficiary. You cannot destroy them, you cannot disturb them. And what does it happen here? A personal individualized knowledge of mind is being transcended to a collective level, to something outside you. That which is inner to me, that which is personal individual to me, is being extended to one more step, that is external to me. Similarly, that which is a personal profit for me, it needs to be translated into a collective effort. You need to give up. You cannot do that. Have you heard the word sustainable development? You all keep in management and law, this is one of the most important term which you all should study time and again. Sustainable development means you can develop the natural resources in any way you want, but you should be able to sustain it for future generation. What are the two components of sustainable development? Yes, what you told is correct. Why you need to develop it or why you need to sustain it for future development? Because they can survive. They can survive. Yes, what is it called? It is based on a principle of what? Huh? Judicious use of why do you need to judiciously use the resources? You can use the resource the way you want. Why you need to give? Resources are scarce. Resources are scarce. Huh? Wants are unlimited. Wants are unlimited. Greed comes. Yes. But it is based on what principle? It is based on a principle called equity. That is why sustainable development has two principles. Intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity. Within my own generation, I cannot consume everything which will be detrimental to my own succeeding generations and in a way which will lead to the succeeding generations, intergenerational equity between two generations, I should also leave because they also are part of the earth. I cannot use it. So a judicious use comes. And to make people understand, they say that your wants are to be limited. You cannot go by greed. You have to go by need. What you want to have, you have. You cannot have more than what you are supposed not to have. Sustainable development is one more point, yet another point in which the same principle of integral knowledge is applied which is from the individual to the collective, from the external to the inner and it is multidimensional. Clear? Take the case of, have you studied the directive principles of state policy? Take the case of fundamental duties. You know Indian constitution has prescribed some duties for all of you. That you have to respect national flag, you have to respect national anthem, you have to respect the nature. Is it a thing to be told? Is it a thing to be told that you have certain duties towards fellow citizens, you have duties towards culture, you have duties towards tradition, you have duties towards your country. And you know one of the important point of fundamental duty is to develop the spirit of humanism and to develop the spirit of scientific temper. To develop science as well as humanism, to develop the spirit of scientific temper as well as humanism, that is integrality. That is also integral knowledge. That can come only from integral knowledge. It is a knowledge that which integrates. Because there is one underlying knowledge which if you hold it, you will be able to see it. If you have something which you call it as integral knowledge, you will be able to understand your own personal self, individual self as well as the collective. When you walk on the road, you will be able to see where when the water is leaking, when the tap is leaking, you will be able to put it off. You may wonder why I should do that. There is no need for me to do that. But you are doing it because you feel. That feeling is an integral component. What, what I am not related with, I am able to feel. What you are not related with, but you are able to feel. 
I have made 10 crore amount of profits, but I am ready to give 2 crore. Why I am giving? Because I feel like giving. Why I feel like giving? Because you are also a part of me. And this is what the constitution says. This is what the management says. The latest principles on management is that only. Corporate social responsibility. Corporate, social, they, they, they two are totally at two loggerheads. You know how socialist tendencies worked. They pooled all the common resources of the state and it was held by the state. Whereas the capitalist economy like US, they said that each and every one can make the best use of the resources and they make profit out of it. But corporate social responsibility, these two are mixed now. It's because it is precisely to make you feel individual as well as collective. It's precisely to make you feel inner as well as outer, internal as well as external, and to feel you as well as the unidimensional versus multidimensional. That particular integrality is this integral knowledge.